excuse my voice. Josiah gave me a bad case of, of uh, what is it? Well, it's really uh, strep throat, but. <coughs> <coughs> so we'll see how well I do in this class. Genesis chapter 9. And um, <coughs> let's begin with um, verse 8. And I will tell you that we are going to endeavor to finish this class tonight. So I may have to read some. We'll just see how we go. Okay, beginning with verse 8, <coughs> Genesis chapter 9. And God spoke unto Noah and to his sons with him, saying, and I, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you and with every living creature that is with you of the fowl of the cattle of every beast of the earth with you <clears throat> from all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth that I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of flood, neither shall there be any more flood to destroy the earth. God said, this is the token of the covenant which I make between me between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I do set my bow in the clouds and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh and the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it, that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. <coughs> and God said unto Noah, This is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. <coughs> all right. In the story of the flood, we've got not only the, uh, well, we've got the Holy Spirit being seen in two different ways. <coughs> I've mentioned a book that I wrote that we've, I've never put out or finished yet, but <coughs> rather lengthy, and it's, it's dealing it's with the subject of Noah, and it deals with the dove <coughs> in the ark and his work there. However, um, the Lord later showed me, and, and you know, this is along the lines of what we've been sharing here. That, that book is complete in that sense. But the Lord showed me <coughs> that the Holy Spirit operates in two different ways. He operates in the earth to get people into the new creation. <coughs> or you could say he operates in the ark because the earth is flooded. <coughs> The people uh, that were flooded died, but the people that were chosen, the people that were open, the people that wanted the Lord, they were in the ark. And so the dove, <coughs> or the symbol in the ark, was the dove. Okay, that out once once you land, once you arrive at the new creation, then the symbol changes. And uh, just to say it like this, uh, though I'll, I'll qualify it in just a second, uh, he becomes more like a, a rainbow. And his work is in relationship to the new, not in the old. And, and an example of that, keep your place here in Genesis, because we will come to but a, a good example of that is over here in the Gospel of John when Jesus begins to talk about the coming of the Holy Spirit. John 16. <coughs> and here Jesus begins to show the two different works of, of the Holy Spirit. The first work is as a dove. That dove is trying to get you to identify what is the Lord, what is the new creation. But the, once you are in, then he works with you in a different way. He's not trying to get you in. He's not trying to awaken you to in. He is dealing with you as if you were already in. Does that make sense? And so Jesus describes it in John 16, verse 7. 
and verse 7 through 11 are the Holy Spirit <clears throat> working in the earth, dealing with us to bring us like he would in the Old Testament. Dealing with us to bring us into the new creation. So here we have, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Okay, now notice, well, let me finish reading. Sin because they believe not on me. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. <clears throat> notice all of that's dealing with the devil in the earth or it's dealing with um, sin. Um, and <clears throat> let's face it. If you know anything about the Holy Spirit, you know that his primary heart is not just to be in the earth dealing with people about sin or the devil. Does that make sense? However, <clears throat> until we are firmly established in Christ, he has to deal with those things. He has to reprove. His work begins to be reprove or to do the things that it's talking about here. <clears throat> But there's a different relationship with the Holy Spirit when your focus now has become the new creation, Christ, and being found in the new creation, being found in Christ. And so Jesus goes on from there in verse 12 uh, through 14. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. So the bridge between verse uh, 7 through 11 and verse 13 and 14 is verse 12, where Jesus, after stating those things, says, I've got a lot of things I'd like to talk to you about, but you, you, you don't really understand it yet. <clears throat> and then he says, but nevertheless, it's almost like, nevertheless, I'm going to say this other part, and you'll remember it later, hopefully. Okay, nevertheless, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. So here you see, the, if I may put it in this manner, the twofold work of the Holy Spirit. The work of the Spirit to get us in Christ, to, to hurt us, in Christ to funnel us there and then a whole nother work of getting us conformed to the Christ that we are one with okay those two symbols in Noah are the dove and the rainbow now now let me be a little more uh, specific here he's not really the rainbow he's the prism not prison, prism. It's a different thing. Now, we'll, I will talk about that in just a second. Let me make sure I'm caught up here. <clears throat> uh, there's a difference between the Holy Spirit in the ark and the Holy Spirit in resurrection. Or you could say there's a difference between the Holy Spirit dealing with us in the cocoon and the Holy Spirit dealing with us as a butterfly. Does that make sense? I mean, two different completely different dealings going on. The dove, shows, the dove, the symbol of the dove, the dove, shows the work of the Spirit in the ark, endeavoring to get us into the new creation. But the rainbow represents the Holy Spirit to those who are now dwelling in the reality of resurrection with Christ. And uh, I, I remember when the Lord showed me those scriptures in John some time back, and he gave me more to it than what I just shared. But it was a real eye-opener because he's saying the Holy Spirit, when he first gets here, he's going to deal with you like you're in a cocoon. He's going to deal with you to get you somewhere. He said once you're there, he's going to open your eyes to the reality of what you have. <clears throat> um, so you could say that the dove works for those who are outside, works on those who are outside, and uh, the rainbow works on those who are inside. All right. So now again, the reality is that the Holy Spirit 
Well, let me say this before I forget it, because I don't think it's in these notes here. I told you at the beginning of the class I knew what happened to Noah's Ark. <clears throat> and I do. Noah's Ark represented being in Christ. <clears throat> but it didn't represent the fullness of that reality. What happened to the Ark was that it landed, it unloaded, and then it disintegrated, losing its first form and came forth again, and I know this is all spiritual, but it is the truth, as the rainbow, and Jesus is the rainbow in that it is his light seen in many different angles, because every angle on a prism gives you a different color, many different uh, facets, all the same Jesus, <clears throat> okay? So, that, so someone says, well, I hope we find the, the ark, in keeping with the spiritual reality that it represents, it would have to disintegrate and lose its former form. It's, it's the same as Jesus uh, being incarnated and walking the earth as a man, but then giving up that body for a larger body. Does that make sense? You know, somebody turn the heat on. I have words for you that are warm and gracious. Gracious is warm in here. <laughs> okay. Um, so let me read a paragraph here. Just as light is seen, uh, just as light is unseen, and, and you do, I mean, these things are putting out light, just like the sun does, but you can't really see the light. You're seeing what the light's showing up, but you're not seeing the light. So just as light is unseen without a prism, and I hope you're all familiar with the concept of a prism. It's a, it's a, 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 a triangle, but it's a long, long about like that. And when light hits it, it breaks that light into different colors and stuff like that. And that's where the rainbow comes from, and that's where, you know, all this, you know, anything you see that has rainbowish traits there's a prism effect. Uh, <clears throat> and it, when the light shoots out of the prism, it's a prism break. Never mind. <clears throat> Just as light is unseen without a prism, so Jesus would be unseen also if not for the Holy Spirit. No longer dove. No longer trying to get you. No longer showing you evidences like little twigs and stuff. Now he, you're there and he's enlightening you to the whole reality of this new creation. He's showing you Jesus, the one that you're one with. Pure light is not seen by the human eye, but only the objects that sunlight shows us. Therefore, it requires a prism which takes light and shows it to us. The Holy Spirit takes the light, Jesus is the light of the world, and breaks him into many colors and shades, many facets, many, he, he does it from different angles and stuff like that. <clears throat> he reveals the resurrected Christ from many different angles and aspects, which are all unrelated to the old world, to sin, and to the fall of mankind. This is the resurrected Jesus. This is, that's why I said the Holy Spirit, Jesus said when he comes, he's going to deal with you about sin. He's going to deal about your judgment and the judgment of the devil of this world. Is, you know, he'll deal with you about all of that, but that's all ark dealing. That is not new creation dealing. Once you're in the new creation, folks, there is an understanding that everything died and now we're one with the new creation and that, that new, what's new about it is Christ. Not us. We're not made new. We're made one. I mean, it's a powerful reality. You know, we're not made better. We're made one. Is that better? Oh, baby. But, it, but it's, we're not made better. We're brought in to the, if you will, the sap of the vine. And his spirit, his life, his nature begins to flow in and through us. So uh, his work is now based on revealing Christ who is above and not just the work of Christ for sinners. And when I say which is above, that prism takes that sunlight or, if you will, 
the, you know, and we're, we're describing an invisible prism here because that's what the Holy Spirit is. When you see the rainbow, when you see the light, you see the substance of the light, not what the light shows up, but now with, through the rainbow, you're actually seeing the light itself and not the work of the light. When you see the rainbow, the unseen prism is the Holy Spirit who is taking that light from above and breaking it to us and making it real to us. All right, so the ministry of the dove is for bringing us into the new creation, and I <clears throat> put in parenthesis Pentecost, <clears throat> and I, I did that. Some of you may remember when I was talking about the work of the Holy Spirit when we were talking about the Day of Atonement and two different works and uh, how the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost, but there is a renting of the veil that takes place in the seventh month. You don't see the Holy Spirit there, but when that veil is rent, that's him at work. The early going of Pentecost gifts and joy and all this other stuff and it's great stuff and it's wonderful and thank God for it and I, w I, I wish that everybody can experience that and then move on, you know, and then move on to perfection. <clears throat> but once you get to the Day of Atonement, this isn't salvation, folks. This is the time of entering the veil, entering in through the veil with the high priest. This is a time of oneness. This is the work of the Spirit that is not, you know, falling on us and giving us gifts for rich and sinners. This is the Holy Spirit renting the veil that we may see the one that we're one with and be changed into that same image from glory to glory. So let's see. Uh, I guess I said hi. <clears throat> okay. The ministry of the dove is for bringing us into the new creation, Pentecost. But the prism is for sustaining our faith. And I put uh, the redemption of the purchased possession. Again, keep your place in uh, Genesis, if I can find a marker here. Um, and in Ephesians 1, it says that. And I'm not going to elaborate, but I will tell you <clears throat> that it is speaking of, of this reality. Ephesians 1, in verse uh, 13 and 14, in whom... It's talking about, well, in Christ is the words just in front of this. In Christ, in whom ye also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and in whom also after you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. Folks, let me just say, sometimes... I, I, I don't, I'm sure it happens still, but in my, you know, first 20 years, I would read stuff like this and go, <laughs> I mean, uh, honestly, it was just like another language. It was just like, what, what did he say? I have just read over and over and over stuff like that. And just, and uh, it's like, uh, hello, I'm not getting this. Basically, here's what he's saying. Uh, the, the last two words in verse 12 are in Christ, verse 13, in whom you also trusted. Notice, past tense. Anybody notice that? Past tense. Also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Okay? This is the early receiving of the Lord, which cannot take place apart from the Holy Spirit. Nobody ever just turned their heart and did it. It's called prevenient grace. It's God working in our life in the power of the Holy Spirit to bring us, <clears throat> okay? But then all of a sudden it changes. It changes the, 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 the grammar from past tense to present tense. Um, in whom also, oh, we've got another subject when we use the word also, but, we're, but it's the same subject. It's the work of the Holy Spirit in whom also, after you believed, got all this basic stuff laid down, the, the cocoon stuff laid down. You were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise who is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption, until, until the redemption of the purchased possession. And 
the redemption of the purchased possession. Well, wait a minute. I thought if you're purchased by Jesus, that is redemption. Well, it is and it isn't. God has to open our eyes to the glorious redemption, the glorious, and I, I kind of like the way this worded it, past tense, the thing was salvation, present working, he called it redemption. And so anyway, I, I've already elaborated more than I wanted to because I've got a lot of ground to cover. But <clears throat> I'm using these scriptures as a groundwork to show, again, the twofold work of the Holy Spirit. And, and so, you know, the Holy Spirit may bring you to a season where it's no longer the first month. You remember Pentecost? Actually, it was, it was what, the 50 days after, uh, whatchamacallit? So first couple, it was within the first couple of months. And you experience all of this joy and all this fun and all this healing and all these blessings and all this stuff. But then you start getting down towards the end of the harvest and it's not just about him going. See, this is, the, this is the mindset of most people. On the Day of Atonement, he goes in and we get all of our sins forgiven and then we go our way. Old covenant, maybe. But the new covenant, what that represents is the high priest goes in and takes us in. That's actually what happened. And we sat down with him in heavenly places. Ephesians you know what that's just all that it talks about prior to what we just read right here the whole first chapter up to this point is saying that very thing and so there is this this reality of uh, of joy and wonderful things but god expects the harvest to mature and he wants to bring us to a place where the holy spirit can take us through the veil because the thing that he's trying to redeem us now, it was like before he's saving us from this punishment. He's saving us from uh, sins. And he's saving us from a hell. And he's saving us from the devil. Now we're the ones who need redeemed. And the only way that that true, full redemption happens is for us to be changed into his same image. Not just changed by him but changed into his image because it is that image, that nature, that will truly and fully re redeem us. All right, so, you, so he's saying you got the Holy Spirit of promise for something, not just to get saved or not just to have fun or joy or whatever. All right, um, the dove witnesses the resurrection to us but he does not return in that form. Remember, the dove brought the, the leaf and the olive branch. He witnesses, but he, he does not return in that form. Once he finally leaves, because the new creation is being established and you're about to come into it, he leaves and he comes back as the prism that shows the rainbow or the lore. He comes back as a rainbow prism and sustains us in the new creation with light from above. Hallelujah. The, reali the reality the Spirit gives concerning the resurrected Christ is what sustains us. Now people go, well, why didn't the Lord do a miracle for me? Or why didn't he? He figures you're past that first couple of months of your walk spiritually. He's wanting to do a deeper work. He's wanting to do the real thing, not just to, you know, you know, keep your flesh alive but out of trouble. You know, <laughs> he wants, he wants his son formed in us. We were created as his body. We were created as his bride, not to be who we are, but to be one with him and who he is. All right. So let's uh, look in the book of Revelation, chapter one. I'm just going to read verse 6 and 7. 
And he hath made us a kingdom of priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. I don't know if you, if, if you notice particularly the words that are in uh, Genesis 9 that we read. But it says, when the clouds come, the rainbow's going to come. I mean, it says that. It's really, for lack of a better term, cool. <laughs> he didn't say there wouldn't be any more storms. He said, I'll show up. Okay? <clears throat> so, now that said, let's go to uh, Revelation 10. Yes, I hope I've got all my scriptures right here. I, yeah. Revelation 10, verse 1. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as though it were the sun, and his feet, uh, his feet like pillars of fire. And, you know... Uh, let me look in one more place here. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Revelation 4. All right. Revelation 4 is about to get to the heart of this thing. Verse 2. And immediately I was in the spirit. Now that's good news. I've seen some of you in the flesh. And it's... This is, this is good. And immediately I was in the spirit. Because you know when you're in the spirit, stuff's going to happen. I was in the spirit and behold, a throne was set in heaven. And one sat on the throne. Okay, so we're getting a heavenly view all of a sudden because of the spirit. Can I get an amen? All right. And then verse 3, and he that sat was to look upon like jasper and sardis stone and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like an emerald so here's this rainbow in heaven no it's not just in heaven floating around it's over the throne all right so you have the rainbow in genesis you have the rainbow in revelation i wrote that's why the same work seen in genesis is also seen in the book of revelation where is the Holy Spirit located in the pictures given in the book of, the, of Revelation? Where is he in the heavenlies there? I mean, I just, I want you to think about that just for one moment. God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You get in the book of Revelation, you see God, you know, on the throne. You see Jesus, the Lamb. Where's the Holy Spirit? Well, he's unseen, but his work is not unseen. For he is showing forth the glories of Christ, the, the light. He's breaking the light up for us so we can see the light. Because we, as I said, you, you can't see light here. You just see what it does. And so there he is right there at the throne with the Father and with the Son. <clears throat> so uh, he is there overshadowing the throne. There we see the sweet prism. He is invisible, but making Jesus seen. The Holy Spirit reveals to us the throne of the Lamb established in the bride. New Jerusalem is the bride. This throne is within her. This Lamb is on this throne. And this Holy Spirit is making the light of it. That's why you don't need any light. I mean, the truth is, this, this Holy Spirit is taking this light, even though that you don't need any light because it's the Lord. You will only see what Jesus does for you if the Holy Spirit doesn't change from being a dove to a prism and open our eyes to see him who is the light. Then our hearts, then our connection begins to be with him and not with what he does. 
the way that I used it many years ago in a book, 20, 30 years ago, seeking God for his hands or for his face. His hands is what he can do for you. His face is who he is. That's the work of the Spirit working in this situation. <clears throat> he is invisible, but making Jesus seen. The Holy Spirit reveals to us the throne of the Lamb established in the bride. When we see this heavenly sight, then we know that the floods are past. Anybody ever wondered when the floods are going to quit? Anybody ever felt like that? I mean, trust me, if you're in the cocoon, if you're in the ark, you're not just worried about the beasts. You're wondering when this flood's going to quit. Right? You're ready for a change. But this change only comes through the Holy Spirit, and it only comes after the work of the, of the Lord in the cocoon, in the ark, has done its deal in us, whatever that is. There's no way to describe that because, you know, number one, we're all different. Surely God deals differently, so I can tell you my experience, but my experience is not the standard. And to do that might make you start looking for my experience and miss yours. But I can tell you, I can tell you that there is a dealing, there is a process, an arc process that will eventually, if you let God, and here's the deal, you know, um, somebody said to me recently, would you pray for so-and-so, pray something away that's da-da-da-da, well, I happen to know what it was, and it was not the devil or God, it was them that was doing something that was causing this. And I said, well, if I pray, uh, you're going to have to go away. <laughs> you know? <clears throat> and, and it's things like this. This is why people love me so. <laughs> um, but none, nonetheless, the truth, when we don't want to jump the time, we don't want to let the raven soul have its way. We want to finish out the work of God in the in the ark. All right. <clears throat> All right, let's talk about the rainbow and judgment. The rainbow is an eternal witness of God's ark provision and its security. The prism, capital meaning the Holy Spirit, the prism relieves us of our fears of judgment because he takes our view out of an earth existence and sets our eyes above. You look up to see the rainbow, right? The rainbow is always in the heavens. It's never like, oh look, there's a rainbow walking right beside me, or right over here, you know? That's why people, you know, they say, you know, in Ireland or whatever, if you find the end of the rainbow, there's a, you know, leprechaun with a pot of gold. However, no one's ever found that because in reality, the rainbow, in one sense, it never s touches the earth because the angle of the sun and the light that's doing it isn't coming from that angle. It's, it's coming, God is coming from his angle and, and all of the fear of judgment and all of the things that we worry about, what he does is he lifts up our eyes to the heavens and we begin to see Christ, the light of the world, the light of life, through the eyes of the Holy Spirit and this beautiful color. And not only are, is our eyes heavenward, not only are we seeing Jesus made manifest by the Holy Spirit, but we are seeing the promise, the covenant of God that says, as long as you're seeing me, you don't have to worry about judgment. Why? Because we're one with him. We're one in him in the new creation. Okay. <clears throat> that rainbow is the biggest reminder of the new creation than anything else. It's saying all things are new here. <clears throat> and we think all things are new because it's all been washed and cleaned up. What's new about it is that God's dealing is completely different. Now he sees us as one with himself. 
All right, so the Spirit takes us out of the earth into the clouds. And, and what it says in Genesis is, the bow will be in the clouds, and I will look, and I will remember my covenant. There, having that focus, every eye sees Jesus. Because he is the light of the world, and the Holy Spirit is making him known from above. <clears throat> the rainbow is not a product of the ear, but it's for the eye. And I won't get into all of that. Many of you have studied that out before, and I've taught on it. The difference between hearing something and seeing something. In uh, Revelation, uh, what is it, first chapter over there or fifth chapter? He says, I turned to see the voice and I saw a lamb. Okay? <clears throat> hearing something is good. We need to hear from God. You know, people think they're doing really good when they hear from God. But there's a step beyond that, and that is to see God, to see Him and be changed into that same image. Hearing from you will give you the best wisdom and direction you could have. Seeing him will change you into something that is nothing like you. If you, if you, want, if you want change, ask for direction. Hear it from God. If you want to be changed, ask to see Jesus. <clears throat> the change comes to our lives through the eye. The spirit is the testifier of resurrection and of no more judgment. Isn't he? Yeah. The bow is in the clouds, which means that God looks up as he looks up at Christ and not down at man. Because he said, I will remember, I will look at the fact, the, the bow, the rainbow. I will remember my covenant. See, that's even much more powerful than you remember it. Because you're forgetful. He's not. <clears throat> Let's see. The, no matter how badly we fail in the earth, the bow, the rainbow, is a reminder to God before the throne. Where was that rainbow we saw in the book of Revelation? Around the throne. Uh, is a, a reminder, the rainbow is a reminder to God before the throne that Jesus bore the judgment. This, this is, the, see, you see how not random this stuff is? It is just not, you know, so many people's relationship with God and their understanding of how he operates is very random. Like, well, you know, I don't know, I've got, you know, what is that, what is that old saying? You, you know, uh, I asked the guy once something about so-and-so about the Lord, and he said, well, you never know. Uh, God works in mysterious ways. And I thought, first of all, that's not in the Bible. That's not a scripture. God works in mysterious ways. Somebody said it, and that made it valid. You know, God works in ways we don't understand because we're dumb. <laughs> and I don't mean that bad, but I mean, but he works in very clear-cut ways. The goal is to learn his ways, learn his heart, learn what makes him tick. Just find out about the Lord. And the more you know him, the more you'll know his ways. Okay? All right, so um, we, we find comfort that God is reminded and keeps it before the throne of power. Yeah, see, because this rainbow isn't just floating around on the clouds with the angels that are on the clouds playing harps. This rainbow is over the throne of power. You could call it the throne of judgment. Constant reminder to him of what Christ did. That Christ bore us, that he took us through, he took us down into death, he took us down into burial, and he brought us up in resurrection. And this is a constant reminder that the power that he's got now is not going to be to destroy man anymore. Resurrected man, new man. Amen?
It works to keep the throne of judgment a mercy seat. Because it, it is the mercy seat. <clears throat> this covenant is not just for anyone, but for every creature on the earth who yet fails. Look up. Look up. Don't try to get God involved with your problems. You, get, you see what he's done, and when you see it afresh by the Holy Spirit, it'll give you strength and ability to go on. It'll give you the want to. It will be glorious. But as long as you're just trying to deal with you and your beasts, oh, my God, you can forget it. You know, there, that's an endless cycle. It really is. The judgment upon condemning thoughts is the bow, the rainbow. It drives them away. Can you see while he's sitting there looking at the rainbow, Noah's looking at it, and all of a sudden a hyena runs by? You ain't mine anymore. You know? And he begins to focus on the reality of what God did through the flood and through the ark and now settled in the new creation. <clears throat> the bow says, the judgment is over. I am risen and soon will be seen in full glory. Now I'm basing that on just the regular meteorological phenomenon of a rainbow. You've just had a big storm, it's scary, it's you know all this kind of stuff. Then you start seeing in the clouds, you start seeing a rainbow and everything, and that's a promise of the sun himself eventually breaking out in full glory. You, you see what I'm saying? And so you're, you're going, I don't see Jesus, I don't see Jesus. Can you see the rainbow? Can you allow the Holy Spirit to begin to break him to a certain degree that you can at least see that? No, you probably don't see him in full glory. I know I don't. I know there are men on this earth that do. I'm not one, you know. But I know that the Holy Spirit is faithful. And he was faithful in that stinking ark. And he, he's even more faithful when he gets in his element, the new creation, and we get in it with him. <clears throat> I like that statement. The rainbow says, the judgment is over. I am risen and soon will be seen in full glory. Uh, the scripture we read in Revelation 1 7, I, I said, Jesus is clothed with clouds. He's clothed with clouds, which are a sign of storms, floods, and coming judgment. Amen? But there was also the rainbow that we saw in Revelation 10. There are clouds, but we see the rainbow in it. The Lord, the cloud, and the rainbow descend and takes us out of the earth, out of the focus. And this is the picture of Jesus coming back the way we read it in the first chapter, uh, coming in the clouds representing that rainbow, representing the light being seen, the light of life being seen by us and every eye that sees him will be taken out of the earth. Okay, not, not some event someday, but the reality that we can see the Lord now in these manners if we will search the scriptures and will allow the Holy Spirit to show him to us. Uh, there are clouds, but we see the rainbow in it. The Lord, the cloud and the rainbow descends and takes us out. It seems that the bow is there with Jesus on the throne or in the air, or everywhere he is. Everywhere he is. And I didn't get into the picture. I, I don't even know that I do get into the picture. I don't think I do. But in the book of uh, Ezekiel, there's the picture of the one on the throne. And there's the rainbow. God opens the heavens. God shows him the throne. God shows him the one on the throne. And thank God, or we would just melt like a slug having salt poured on us if that rainbow wasn't there because we, would, we couldn't stand in the presence of someone so perfect, so pure, so holy. We couldn't. None of us could. 
But that rainbow says the judgment's over, and, I, and it's like God saying, I look at that every day. I look at that, every, and it's a token of my covenant that I made with you. No more curse, no more judgment. He, and then speaking of the, the rainbow, I, I put, he never leaves it. The Lord never leaves it. He, he says it is a sign of his covenant with us. So the promise remains. The judgment comes to the earth in Genesis 9 and in Revelation 10. Yet, once the judgment of God uh, is gone, the earth remains. What survives? Seed time, harvest, the bringing forth, the cycle of the seed, the cycle of, again, getting more seed, a cycle of, yeah, judgment, you know. Uh, you, you know, I mean, even forest, great forest and and the West that catch on fire and burn and it looks so terrible after that, it becomes ripe and glorious. Um, uh, what was it? Um, Mount St. Helens, when it blew just for, you know, miles and miles, it was just looked like desert, just, just you know, death. But it didn't take very long, life started springing back and coming back and here it came and here it comes. Because God is trying to get his son over and over in as many people as he can. He judges all the junk and then brings forth more and new life out of it. <clears throat> and so that's what that, that, that judgment is. Yeah, there'll be judgment, but, but there will also be a withholding of it. It won't be an all-out judgment because I'm working on something greater than just judging. I'm working on getting my son. What, what survives? Seed time and harvest, etc. The seed and its provision remains. For God to withhold the rain is to withhold the rainbow because some of the judgment was, I will withhold rain from you. To withhold the rain, folks, means you're withholding the rainbow. And we'll talk about that in, in, a, in a little bit that happened with Noah's son and how they never, they didn't respect the, the covenant, they didn't respect the rainbow. Um, so for God to withhold the rain is to withhold the rainbow, and there must be rain to be a rainbow. It does not speak of the removal of all judgment, but of not coming to utter destruction, but of hope in the end. Rain and lightning and da-da-da-da, but then it stops. And then the rainbow comes again. <coughs> no more fear that this is the end of me. This is, do you understand what that says? It says there's always hope. It says no matter how bad things get, God made a covenant through Christ. And that there's hope of what? Not hope for you, you're hopeless. Christ in you, the hope of glory. There is always, he'll never give up on that. You know, that, I'll just tell you that as a little secret. You know, the Bible says the secret of the, of the Lord is with those that fear him. I figured out many, many, many years ago that he had this plan of bringing forth Christ and, and, and developing Christ in us and that most Christians had this road or that road or that road all heading in different directions, but not his road. And I figured out the way to be successful is to get on board with what is most dear to his heart and you'll never be out of the loop. And the, 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 the uh, rainbow is proof of that. He keeps you in that even if there's judgment, seed time and harvest will not. It's kind of like, I don't know, that's not a good example, but it's, it's, it's kind of like somebody that has a job that is uh, uh, depression proof or what do they call it right now? The, the economy, recession proof, which is nothing compared to a depression. But, you know, finding a job that is recession proof. Well, folks, that's what we're doing in the Lord. We're finding the one thing that he'll never give up on. For example, I mean, the Lord showed me all this and he showed me, well, there's this wave of the Holy Spirit and people are, you know, I'm 
barking like dogs or whatever, they're, you know, to the glory of God. And there's another wave of the Holy Spirit and people are praying one hour at, you know, four in the morning and there's another wave over here and it's, you know, and, uh, and everybody was, they were writing books on the next wave of the Holy Spirit and you gotta get into the next wave and stuff. You know, and I noticed that these waves are, you know, I was around for a while, so I noticed that wave came and then it went back out and it's gone. Another wave came in and it didn't look like the last one. It looked different and stuff. And I realized, you know, the whole ocean, it's there all the time. We're over here on the earth, on the shore, in the dirt, trying to catch a wave when we need to get out in the big middle of the thing. And what I mean by that is this, just this reality of finding out what it is that God always has his attention on. That he, he will not be diverted. He won't do for a while, splash on the shore and end that. Find what that is. And I believe I found it. And I believe that's a key to continuing in the Lord. I believe it's a key to having a ministry that continues in the Lord. And, and I remember at one juncture, a wave came in. This is 20 years ago or more, 25 years ago. A wave came in that was so big. It was just, especially this area, just flooded. The wave of, you know, the Holy Spirit and, and having big churches and all this stuff. And everybody was saying, come on, Randy, you got this little bitty church. Why don't you get, get on the wave? And I said, no. And I told them. And I told this to... to some people that were big shots in huge churches. I said, there will come a day that your churches will no longer be around, but this little podunk little group will. Well, folks, those churches are not around either one of them. They were huge and they were thousands and thousands. Now, that's not bragging or anything. It's just that we didn't catch a wave. Once the wave splashed and ended, they all kind of went, well, what do we do now? And I, I'm not trying to make fun. I'm just, you know, we need to get hold of Jesus in the way that it is in his heart that he never changes over. <clears throat> All right. I uh, don't know if I'm going to, I was hoping to make it to the end of this one little section. Um, the seed and its provision remains. For God to withhold the, the rain is to withhold the rainbow. There must be a rain, rain to be a rainbow. It does not speak of removal of all judgment, but of not coming to utter destruction, but hope in the end. It shows the long suffering of God on his part, how even when there's judgment, man, there's a lot of people going to be judged and a lot of stuff. But this rainbow doesn't say I'm perfect, doesn't say you're perfect. It says God keeps his eye on that. And if you'll agree with God on what he says, you'll be okay. <clears throat> Notice that the altar of Noah was first and then God gave the rainbow. That was the order. I didn't read that, but that, that's the order. He built the altar and then God gave the rainbow. <clears throat> These two are tied together. The cross of Christ, Christ left its witness, the Holy Spirit. Once the cross was done, there's, there's Calvary and then there's Pentecost. There's the altar, and then there's the prism, the rainbow. Calvary is first, then Pentecost. The bow witnesses to the altar and its finished work. The Spirit came to declare the finished work of the cross. Now there is no more curse. Christ has come in death, acknowledged by the altar. Now he has come in the clouds, as revealed by the Holy Spirit. The bow says that God is satisfied with the judgment of the flood and the judgment of the uh, ark and the judgment of the altar. It declares, the sun is coming up, all is settled. Around the throne, God's bow never disappeared, but we only see a rainbow on earth during rare occasions. God sees it all the time. We see a rainbow very rarely, if you think about it. God sees it every day. This fact speaks of our lapses and failures, but the rainbow around the throne speaks of God's unwavering faithfulness. In Revelation 4, when heaven is opened, we see the true rainbow. And we do not need one in our skies. We can see it any time we choose to look toward God's throne. Just, is, that, is that good and you want to give me five? <laughs> well, 
Well, I read that so fast, I'm not going to use my five minutes. Okay, let's take a break. Well, looks like we're going to make it.